Tiny Desk in recent years has been on an explosive rise in popularity, hosting a truly unique and intimate experience with some of the biggest stars in music from behind a desk in a small office in Washington, D.C. Or sometimes even from the comfort of the artist's home, creating these warm and authentic musical experiences that otherwise the majority of the world wouldn't be able to experience. But the real magic of NPR's Tiny Desk is its ability to expose musicians who might have never been heard before to the masses, putting small artists on a spotlight to shine and giving them a platform to share their life's work with the world. Since its humble beginnings in 2008, Tiny Desk has been a source of musical discovery for fans and a golden opportunity for artists to share their art. With with over 800 performances in the last 15 years, Tiny Desk has garnered over 2 billion views on YouTube alone because of the world's love for this intimate format. But who's the man behind this idea? And what's the story behind how this unique musical format became so popular? Let's find out as we take a deep look into the explosive rise of Tiny Desk. To really get an understanding of why Tiny Desk has so much character and personality, we need to go back to 1979 in a club in DC called DC Space. Filled with empty beer bottles and sweaty intoxicated teenagers, they were all listening to the first live recording of a new band in the DMV area called Tiny Desk Unit. The music was chaotic, it was out of tune, it was dirty, it was pure expression. The band included the lead singer Susan Mumford, Michael Barron on guitar, and on the synthesizers was Bob Boyle. He's the man that years later would open the door for hundreds of artists. The band named Tiny Desk Unit started as an inside joke with Bob Boylan and his friend Bill Worrell who convinced Bob to start the band. In an interview with Vox, Boylan says, the name was something of an inside joke. Our friend Bill had this little tray with a calendar and a pencil holder. He'd just pick it up and move it around. It was his tiny desk. Bill Worrell not only convinced Bob to start a band, but he was one of the founders of the venue that they played at, DC Space. It hosted independent films, punk rock bands, and poetry readings. The venue would give a space for local artists at the beginning of their careers like Sun Ra, Bad Brains, and Philip Glass. DC Space was the only club where a man could run in from the bus stop outside, jump on stage, play the piano, and hop off when the bus arrived to crowd applause. Carl Siphus. The venue was chaotic. It was out of tune. It was dirty. It was pure expression. Unfortunately, this piece of music history would be replaced by a Starbucks. Years later, in an interview with the DCS, Bill World talks about the reconstruction. That is a shame. The world has had one DC space and it has tens of thousands of Starbucks. Although the club was closed in the early 90s, DC Space and clubs like it would plant a seed in the synthesizer playing Bob Boyer's head, which would serve to sprout into something unimaginable. August 15, 1965, the Beatles are playing in a packed New York Shea Stadium for 55,000 entranced raving fans. A young Bob, then 11 years old, 10 miles away at his house in Queens, New York, is listening to the Beatles play through his Westington transistor radio as he gazes out into the distant lights of the venue. In an interview with Vox, Bob reminisces saying, I was so charged up. The idea that you could actually go see a band play was unimaginable. Bob would spend a good portion of his adolescent years listening to FM radio to find new music from radio personalities called tastemakers. The job of the tastemaker would be to curate and introduce new music to the audience which influences the broader musical landscape. This shaped Bob's musical preferences greatly and served to be a title that he would revolutionize years later. While in modern times not done over the radio, the role of the tastemaker is something that has never gone away. If anything, it's only grown more in popularity with social media. People like I Breathe Music All Day, Elsie Natalise, and CC Marie are prime examples of this, sharing their unique taste and passion for music while creating a space for other music lovers. After moving to Bethesda, Maryland in the late 60s, Bob will find himself working at a local record store, Maxi Waxies. Maxi's puts the area's largest selection of music at your fingertips with more records, more tapes, and more compact discs and accessories at stores everywhere in Maryland and
which has served to be something of a training ground for him to develop his skills as a local tastemaker. In an interview with Vox, he says, It was a musical education. I'd spend my entire day listening to different kinds of records and talking about music. It was my job to know the taste of my customers. I became the personal shopper for many people who walked into the store. Bob immersed himself at the record store for years. Eventually, he quit his record store job and invested his entire savings, $2,000, in an ARP Odyssey synthesizer. This one decision would serve to change his life. In the early 80s, polyphonic synthesizers were just becoming popularized, which made Bob become an early adapter, gaining a skill edge. This caused Bob to get recruited for a project called Whizbang, A History of Sound. On Bob Boylan's Instagram, he describes the project. Whizbang imagined the history of sound from the beginning of time to the end of time using a relatively new technology called sampling. Whizbang were going to be featured at the Smithsonian American History Museum in 1983. This caught the attention of a show called All Things Considered by NPR, and they produced a story about it. Five years later, Bob would find himself working at a TV production job, which he absolutely hated. So he quit. And Bob went on to track down the person who covered the story, Ira Glass, to find a job telling similar stories. He would show up at NPR every day for a year. In an interview with Vox, Boylan says, Ira asked me if I cut tape. And I said, sure, I cut tape. Of course, I've never cut tape in my life. And just like that, Bob Boylan was interning at NPR, where he would begin to make his mark on the world of music discovery, not only as a local tastemaker in a record store, but eventually as a global tastemaker. Bob Boylan is the host and creator of NPR's All Songs Considered. One tiny Desk. <laughs> Here we are at the Tiny Desk. <laughs> Very powerful enemy, NPR. Our revenge is made possible by listeners like you. Excuse my voice. I can't sing. <laughs> but I don't fucking care. Because it feels good. Like a warm shower. I think. <laughs> It's 1988, and Bob Boylan has just been hired to work at NPR for their flagship news program called Is All Things Considered? There he worked on a temporary basis as an editor for a year before getting the opportunity to be a director of the show producing music stories and interviewing music writers. I'm gonna go back, way back, to when you came to NPR. 35 years ago, so this was 1988. Yeah. I'm sure we started you out cutting tape because everybody had to start <laughs> cutting tape. But we drafted you pretty quickly to direct all things considered. Just explain to people what that means and how they are, they are hearing your influence on the show every single day. Uh, the director is like an orchestra conductor. I mean, I'm making sure things happen at the right moment, but also I'm trying to segue from story to story in a way that feels seamless listen I do that with music and sometimes it's coming from a very f sad story to a funny story and you got to find a piece of music that you know starts off lighthearted but gets a little thoughtful or something that would be a moment for folks to absorb this intense news that they heard although the snippets of music were supposed to be an afterthought looked at as brief segments Bob's ear for music was loved so much that a spin-off show would eventually be aired in the year 2000 Called. Welcome to All Songs Considered, a music show for your computer. I'm Bob Boylan, and I'm one of the directors of NPR. <laughs> Stop there. A music show for your computer. Like, what was this? <laughs> well, we would get so many letters handwritten about those pieces of music that I'd play between, we'd all play between those news stories. It just seemed to me that the kinds of music and the access that we had to do so much different kinds of music people were loving, but really not a chance to hear them. And why not make a show out of that? And it became NPR's first original yeah, right. podcast so, right who even knew what that was at the time like what is this podcast thing? bob would spend his days curating music playlists for the masses and spend his evenings going to festivals and concerts finding budding artists and songwriters a year later in 2001 he would begin to realize just how powerful and important his job was a sad day that i remember working with you i was line editing all things considered on 9 11 and you were directing mm. I, I still remember coming into the office i had a wall of cds and looking at 
what am I going to play? And then thinking, this is the most irrelevant thing I can possibly think to do. I'm sitting here thinking about what music to play and the world is falling apart. This is ridiculous. What am I doing? I don't remember how far we were along into the show, but it was an intense unfolding. And there was a moment where we had to find some music, and I picked this piece of music from uh, by Philip Glass. At that moment, chills went down my spine, and I choked up because it gave me the moment to absorb what I was hearing. And then the emails started pouring into me from listeners, like how much this meant to them, because for the first time, maybe even in the whole day, this was, you know, four or five o'clock in the afternoon, that they all had stopped for a moment to absorb it. And I realized something I should have known, how music can be such a deep, important thing in our lives. In 2008, Bob Boyle and his soon-to-be co-creator Stephen Thompson were attending South by Southwest, trying to hear singer Laura Gibson, who was giving a performance at the time. No matter what Bob and Stephen tried to do, they ended up not hearing much of her set because the crowd was simply too loud compared to Laura's softer voice. Disappointed that they missed out on what would have been a more enjoyable experience had they heard more of the performance, Stephen half-jokingly invited Laura to the office at NPR to play a more intimate concert which would allow her to be heard. Only a few weeks later, on April 14th, 2008, Laura showed up to NPR's office in Washington, D.C., ready to perform a concert. Bob and Stephen would go on to set up a couple cameras and a microphone, and just like that, this video is what started Tiny Desk. So goes another wind slowly hands in the pockets of my coat you'll be the first to spin your story i'll be the last to let you go while speaking on the first tiny desk concert with vox Bob states there was something that happened there i never would have imagined It was the intimacy as I've come to understand it. There was nothing between you and the artist. There was no silly music video of someone running through a field. It wasn't lip synced, no reverb, studio niceties, just Laura's voice coming through a beautiful microphone. Humble. It just worked. The room would soon crowd up with curious interns in their early 20s and professionals in their early 30s, all with hopes to make a change in the world. They huddled around Laura as she sung her tunes into an office space littered with papers and past due deadlines. The office was chaotic. It was out of tune. It was dirty. It was pure expression. Backstory of this is that uh, Stephen Thompson and I uh, love Laura Gibson's music, and we went uh, eagerly to see and hear at South by Southwest in Austin uh, at the end of the month. And uh, when we got to this place called the Rusty Krusty like Nickel or whatever it was nickel. called, the Thirsty <laughs> Nickel, the something nickel, uh, the the crowd you'll hear Laura is very very uh, gentle, and um, and the crowd just talking was louder than Laura and we we glared at the sound person to try to do anything we could to get we shushed <laughs> we, we even did that and uh, at the end of the concert we realized we hardly heard a word Laura sang and it was sort of really disappointing so uh, she came down off the stage and and uh, Stephen introduced himself to her and yeah and I just I just me. I just realized that rather than going to shows where very quiet singer songwriters are drowned out uh, we could just have them perform at our desks. <laughs> so so uh, it, there's a little element of, uh, of self-interest and laziness, um, but also... And, yeah, she, Laura should be heard. And, and so, so Stephen invited Laura to come play at my desk, and she called the week or whatever so ago and said, I think, basically, I'm coming to town. <laughs> and uh, we said, well, we got the desk ready. <laughs> so we're going to videotape this for our... <laughs> our blog and uh and maybe it's the start of something and maybe it's not but we're certainly glad to have lord gibson here today thank you for doing this (laughs) 
After the show with Laura Gibson in April, it would be three months before the next concert would take place in June from Vic Chestnut, who was in the area for a tour of his next album, North Star Deserter. After that, it would be just a couple weeks before the third Tiny Desk concert, Sam Phillips, would take place. In 2008, Tiny Desk would end the year with a total of 10 performances, catering to mainly post-rock and folk music artists. In 2009, there would be a total of 30 performances over the year, and in 2010, that number would grow to 87 live Tiny Desk performances, still with a majority of indie rock based artists. According to NPR, in October 2014, Franny Kelly, then a co-host of NPR's Microphone Check podcast, noted a lack of hip-hop artists on Tiny Desk and recommended T-Pain. The artist showed up with just a keyboard player and delivered an impressive vocal performance that has since become the most popular Tiny Desk concert ever recorded. So, um, I know everybody's wondering where the auto-tune is going to come from. It's okay, I got it in my pocket. It's totally fine. <laughs> you got it right here. It's all surgically inserted. Um, while T-Pain's Tiny Desk might have been the most popular performance at the time of the article be written in 2016, Tiny Desk has grown massively in popularity from 2016 to 2018 alone, with artists like Gucci Mane, Tyler the Creator, Weezer, Blue Man Group, Ari Lennox, and Taylor Swift, as well as many others exposing the platform to their large cult following fan bases. One of the most iconic Tiny Desk concerts was for Mac Miller, who played Tiny Desk as one of his last live performances before he tragically passed away, almost exactly a month later. This concert keeps Mac's music alive, with many fans, including myself, returning to his video every now and then, and new people discovering his music every day. Tiny Desk was serving to become a true musical archive, a library for people to reference periods of time in recent musical history. You can even use Tiny Desk as a means to see the growth in an artist over the years by comparing two concerts they've done over a span of time. Two examples of that is Sanford's performance in 2017 compared to his performance in 2023, as well as No Name's performances in the same time span. Once viewers watch their favorite artists on Tiny Desk, some tend to fall into rabbit holes discovering new artists they might not have otherwise. I've personally done this numerous times, discovering Tash Sultana, Phoebe Bridgers, and Maya, all thanks to Tiny Desk. In 2020, when the world shut down because of a pandemic, Tiny Desk still found a way to keep the music alive with Tiny Home Desk, allowing artists to submit their own Tiny Desk recordings from their living rooms or studios. Artists like Janae Aiko, Justin Bieber, Dua Lipa were able to share some light through their music in a world that seemed so dark. The music platform was making a name for itself for artists to truly let loose, be themselves, and just play good music. Hiccups and all. If I don't do it right, it's not right. I also want to let you know that edibles just hit. Even with so many large names showing up to do concerts at Bob Boylan's desk, Tiny Desk never lost the core of what it was for in the first place, giving a voice to the voiceless artist. Since 2014, Tiny Desk has had an annual contest for any artist to win a chance of having their own Tiny Desk performance, as well as go on tour with NPR in some years. In 2023, Tiny Desk started participating in Black Music Month, birthing the iconic Usher, Juvenile, and Babyface concerts. El Tiny for Spanish Heritage Month was started, and Tiny Desk Korea, a separate channel dedicated to Korean music, was launched. It became hard to run into anybody who hasn't at least heard of Tiny Desk concerts before, making the platform a household name. After 15 years of Tiny Desk and over 30 years at NPR, co-creator Bob Berlin decided it was time for him to retire in October of 2020 and move on in life to other things. <laughs> um, well, this next song is kind of a waltz. Um, you guys are welcome to waltz about the office. <laughs> um, and at the end, there's a, a part that goes just as da 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 da. And um, I know it's Monday morning, but maybe you guys could sing, sing along. That would be really nice. While writing this video unraveling the story behind Tiny Desk's explosive rise, I found not just the mind behind the curation, but a testament to the universal yearning for genuine musical encounters. Whether it be in a stadium of 55,000 people, in a dingy punk rock spot in DC, or even in an office, 
We as people can always count on finding community in a universal language of music. It's something that brings us together in times of isolation. It's a tool that we can use to brighten our days or just at least know that we're understood and a little less alone. Music has impacted millions of people in so many profound ways. So I know I'm not special in saying this and I know it's not anything new, but it's just good to know that even in our darkest days, we can have a bit of light through a three to five minute song. It's good to know that our favorite artist has given us these amazing offerings of art to lean on. It's just good to know. But put simply in the words of an icon. Music is a beautiful thing. All right. Music is a beautiful thing. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing, baby. It's a beautiful thing. Let me tell you something about music. <laughs> it's beautiful. A very special thank you to all the Patreon members who are supporting my channel. You guys are truly helping me realize my aspirations of creating videos just like this one full time. I really appreciate you guys. And if you want to join the Patreon and get my videos ad free and earlier than when I put them on YouTube, then you can click the link in the video description. You can join for only $3 a month or 75 cents a week. Also, check out our Discord if you haven't. The link is in the description. We're active there every single day with conversation and daily activities. And if you really like this video, go ahead and check out my friend Matt Miranda's video on colors. I'll see you guys next time.